Adventures in Time and Space. Transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension X. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, bring you Dimension X. Ralph Waldo Emerson speculated, if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would man believe and adore and perceive for many generations the remembrance of the city of God? Now this was philosophically interesting, but on the edge of the galaxy there is a planet which swings on its orbit in a cluster of six suns. These suns hang in the sky above, Never less than two shine down through the entire 23.8 hours of the planet's day. The yellow light has burned down on the planet continuously into the past, till the mind of man runneth not to the contrary. Theremin was a reporter for the Cerro City Chronicle. He covered them all, from the night police beat to politics to the sports pages. And the city editor wanted him to cover the biggest story of the year, perhaps of all time. It was an interview, a particularly difficult interview. But then, since his first days as a cub, Theremin had specialized in difficult interviews. He didn't expect violence, though, from an astronomer. You're from that newspaper? Well, you've got a lot of gall coming here. Now, wait a minute, Dr. Atton. It's only a job. I've read your paper. You've been riding this observatory for two months now. You've attacked me personally. I have nothing to say to you. All right, look, this is your chance to get your side in the paper. I'll give it to you straight. Two months ago, the observatory issued a press statement that the world was coming to an end. Now, that's the same story that the cult of... Revelations has been preaching. And when a scientist backs that up, it's news. Our conclusions have nothing to do with the cult. The cult of Revelations is full of superstition and mysticism. We are scientists. Yeah. And you got the people pretty angry. That does not matter. <laughs> you know, if I can't get the story from you, I'll have to go somewhere else. Go ahead. All right. You know, Dr. Raton, the paper can be pretty rough on someone who doesn't cooperate. Young man, if you're not out of the observatory within five minutes, I shall call the police. Now get out. The reporter walks down the long hall from the observatory. The light filters through the high windows, the yellow light of gamma, the brightest of the six suns in the planet's sky. Beta is almost at zenith. Its red light floods the landscape to an unusual orange. The planet's sun, Alpha, is at the antipodes. And now as Gamma sinks below the horizon, the red dwarf sun, Beta, is alone, grimly alone. It's a short drive from the observatory to Cerro City, and the red light glares from the highway. The temple of the cult stands, hewn from the solid rock of the Dormite Mountains, outside the city. And in the inner courtyard stands Sor, the priest of the cult. Woe to the unbelievers! Their souls will rot with the absence of light. Sor! Sor, wait! Your reverence, please! Please, tell me, your reverence, what will happen? What are you waiting for here? The day, the day of the coming written in our doctrine of revelations. It came to pass that the sun, Beta, was alone in the sky. The world was shrunken and cold. Men did assemble in the public squares and highways. Their minds were troubled and their speech confused, for the souls of men awaited the coming of the stars. The lip of the cave of darkness passed the edge of Beta, 
and loud were the cries of men. There was no light on the surface of the world. In this blackness there appeared the stars in countless numbers. And in that moment the souls of men departed from them. Their abandoned bodies became even as beasts. The stars then reached down the heavens flame, and where it touched, the cities of the world flame to destruction. So that of man and all the works of man naught remained. So it is written. Sharon, you're the only scientist I could find in the city. Where is everybody? In the hideout. In the hideout? The place bored me. I wanted to be out here where things are getting hot. I want to see the stars the cultists are talking about. Besides, they don't want me at the hideout. I'm too scrawny to survive. Well, now, wait a minute. What is the hideout? Well, we professors have managed to convince a few people that our prophecy of doom is valid. We've got about 3,000 people. They're supposed to hide where the darkness and the stars can't get at them. We hope they'll survive and leave records. Survive? Survive what? Oh, there are lots of names for it. The cultists have their myths. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What about that? What is there to these myths? As a matter of fact, what is there to this, this doctrine of revelation? I'm a psychologist, not an archaeologist. How true it is, I don't know. But the cultists say that every 2,050 years, all the suns disappear, and there is a total darkness. And then they say things appear called stars. Of course, men go mad. They mix all this up with a lot of religio-mystic notions, but that is the central idea. Yeah. Well, that's impossible, isn't it? I mean, there, there are always at least two suns in the sky, most of the time four or five. There are not now, only beta. Dr. Sharon, you mean that there's going to be worldwide darkness tomorrow? That all mankind will go violently insane? What, what's behind that? Well, for one thing, this is history of civilization of the world. We've located a series of cycles of civilizations comparable to our own, all of which, without exception were destroyed by fire at the very height of their culture. All right, all right. But is there any scientific theory behind this and th that would explain it? The University Observatory finished their calculations two months ago. Tomorrow there will be an eclipse of beta so that the planet will become dark. That eclipse comes every 2,049 years. Darkness comes. Maybe those mysterious stars that no man has ever seen. And then, madness and the end of civilization. I see. And the scientists expect to live through this at the hideout, huh? They plan to photograph the eclipse and leave the records, and then the rest of mankind will know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Dr. Sharon, what is there in darkness to drive men mad? Have you ever experienced darkness, young man? No, no, but I know what it is. It's just... Well, no light. Draw the curtain. Well, what for? If we had four or five suns out there, we might want to cut the light down for comfort, but with only beta... That is the point. Just draw the curtain and then come here and sit down. All right. Dr. Sharon, I can't see you. Feel your way. Yeah, but I can't see. I can't see anything. Do you like it? Well, no, no, it's awful. The walls. They seem to be closing in on me. I want to keep pushing them away. All right. Draw the curtain back again. The light. The light. Dr. Sharon, have you, have you got a drink? Right here. That was just a dark room. Yeah. Yeah. 
It wasn't really so bad. You're afraid. Yes, I am. <laughs> just darkness can do that? This isn't just a metaphysical theory, young man. It's promulgated from observed data. Come with me. Where? The locked ward down the corridor. All right. Were you at the Saro City Centennial Exposition two years ago? No, I was overseas on assignment. You remember hearing about the tunnel of mystery that broke all records in the amusement area? Yeah. yeah wasn't there some fuss about it? The Anti-Vice Society had it shut down? It was shut down, all right, but the Blue Noses had nothing to do with it. Oh? That tunnel was nothing but a mile-long passage through darkness. You rode in a little car, and it took 15 minutes to get through. Very popular while it lasted. Popular? There's a fascination in being frightened when it's part of a game. Absence of light is one of the instinctive human fears. People came out of that 15 minutes of darkness shaking and half dead with fear. Half dead? I thought there were some deaths. Bad hearts, but that wasn't the big danger. Now, which key is this? Ah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dr. Sharon. Where are we going? You'll see. No, the heart attacks were actually good for business, but there was something else. Here, I'll show you. I want you to see somebody. Latimer. Latimer. Go away. Latimer, I want you to meet somebody. This is Mr. Theremin. No. No, go away. Hello? He's pushing me. Make him stop pushing me. Go away. I'm not touching him. What's wrong? Latimer is afraid. The walls. They're falling in on me. The walls. I, I've got to get out. Let me out. You can't go out, Latimer. It's all right. I've got to get out. Let me out. Let me out. <laughs> At sleeping period, we have to give him a shot of morphine. Otherwise, he'd bat his brains out against the wall. Well, what's wrong with him? Nothing. Nothing but 15 minutes in the darkness of the tunnel of mystery. Oh, Doctor, that's impossible. One person out of ten came out of the tunnel that way. That's why we had to shut it down. Well, why? Why should darkness do that? It's obvious man cannot exist without light. Longer periods of darkness would obviously be fatal. The scientific theory is that the consciousness of light is necessary for mental activity. Please. Please, doctor, let me outside. Let me outside. Please, I can't breathe. They're pushing me. They're always pushing me. I can't stand them. I can't stand them. <laughs> there you are, Theremin. That's what 15 minutes of darkness will do. Man just wasn't built to operate without light. There are always at least two suns in the sky, most of the time more. Yeah. Just 15 minutes of darkness. Now then, look out of that window. Imagine darkness everywhere. No light as far as you can see. Black. Everything black. And the stars, whatever they are, well, can you conceive it? Your mind wasn't built for that conception. When the real thing comes, you'll go mad completely and permanently. There's no question of it. Tomorrow, there won't be a city left standing in the world. Well, why, Doctor? Why should the cities be destroyed? If you were in darkness, what would you want more than anything else? What would it be that every instinct would call for light? And how would you get light? I don't know. You'd burn something, and every city in the world will go up in flames. Shall we go back to my office, Mr. Theremin, and have another drink? Through the skies, the red sun beta shines alone. The wind howls across the city. It's cold, colder than man can remember. And as the hour approaches, the reporter goes out and speaks to the man in the street. Uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, but I'm from the Chronicle. I'd like to talk to you. Ah, a reporter, huh? That's right. My name is Pallet. Two L's. Remember the two L's. Uh, all right. Now, Mr. Pallet, what's your occupation? Power technician at the North Division plant. Uh-huh. You're making some kind of a survey, huh? Yeah, yeah, in a way. 
Where are you going now? Home for supper. Well, how about... Uh, well, what I mean is, what, what are you going to do tonight? <laughs> you mean about this star stuff? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, mister. It don't stand a reason that the end of the world is going to come boom like that. It, it just don't stand a reason. In other words, you don't believe it. I didn't say that, but it just don't stand a reason. Uh-huh. Have you read what the scientists say? I don't read stuff like that. Only the headlines. Yeah. How about the cult? Well, now, like I always say, I, I've got nothing against religion. You don't believe them either? Well, they've always been shouting about doom and sin. Listen, bud, when you've been around as long as I have, you get to know the score. It's all right to preach that judgment day is coming and all, but just the same, I'm putting money in the bank. Uh-huh. Well, tell me, how about, uh... How about darkness? About what? How would you feel if there was no light? <laughs> you crazy? How could there be no light? Well, now, suppose, suppose all the suns went down at once. Suppose everything was black. Well, it's crazy. What's the use of supposing something like that? It, it couldn't happen. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, that's all. Thank you. Sure. Uh, look, mister, remember, pilot with two L's? <laughs> Oh, excuse me, sir, but huh? I represent the Chronicle, and we're conducting a poll to determine public opinion with regard to the predicted end of the world. How do you feel about it? All this talk of scientific explanation. It's sinful. That's what it is. Oh, oh I see. Well, then you're a member of the cult, sir. I sure am. Been a member since I was a boy. My daddy was a member, too. I've seen the books. It's all written down in the books. Well, don't you believe the scientist's explanation? Don't need it. Going to save my immortal soul. Going to stay on the mountaintop in a white robe while the stars carry me away to glory. Blessed be the stars. Amen. Well, tell me, what are the stars? The glory. The breath of the heaven. The spirit of the ultimate. That's what they are. Uh-huh. Well, sir, the observatory has announced that it intends to take pictures of these stars. Blasphemy! I sold my house, gave all my money to the poor. Won't need it anymore. Going to heaven with stars. Glory, glory, going with the stars! Porter checks the stock exchange, the stores. Business at a standstill. Doesn't pay to buy anything today, not if the world's going to end tomorrow. There are predictions of economic collapse in the financial section, layoffs at the factories on the edge of the city. And through the streets, the people mill and turn, unsure, crying in fear or shouting with bravado. But the story isn't here in the city. And so as the hour approaches, the reporter goes again to the observatory, high in the hills. Now look, Dr. Raton, if you are right, if the world is going to be destroyed, what's the difference if I stay here and observe and take notes? Well, nothing, I suppose, but you'll be in the way. We have work to do. All right, if I stay out of the way. I can't be bothered with you. You'll have to leave, Mr. Theremin. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello, Dr. Sharon. Yeah, this place is like a morgue. It's freezing outside. The wind is enough to hang icicles on your nose. Beta doesn't seem to give any heat at all. It's so far away. Why aren't you in the hideout, Sharon? Me? I'm part of the race that isn't worth perpetuating. Who's got a bottle? There will be no alcohol today. It would be too easy to get my men drunk. I can't afford to tempt them. Well, all right, Thurman, you can stay, but keep out of the way. Well, thank you, Doctor. Well, gentlemen, I think it's time we took our positions. The observatory dome is up these stairs. Yes, sir, after you, Doctor. What's that? dome, quick. Oh, what is it? The plate. The photographic plates, they're all smashed. <laughs> there he is, a cultist. He's going for the telescope. After him. I've got it. This one must be destroyed. It must be. It's all right. It's all right. He didn't harm anything. Let him up. Well, that's the high priest, Dr. Radon. Sore is his name. I was talking to him yesterday. What do you want, Sore? Nothing that you would give me of your own free will. I made a bargain with the cult to give me certain data you had. In return, I promised to prove the essential truth of the creed. There was no need to prove that. 
stands proved by the doctrine of revelations. I offered scientific backing for you believers. You made of the darkness and the stars a natural phenomenon, removed all its real significance. That was blasphemy. The facts exist. Your facts are a fraud and a delusion. How do you know? I know. I suppose you think in trying to warn the world against the menace of madness, we are placing souls in jeopardy. Well, we have not succeeded, if that makes you feel better. Your devilish instruments must be destroyed. We obey the will of the stars. Someone call the police in Cerro City. There's no time for that. Let me handle this. The eclipse is only a few minutes away. Look, Saw. Will you give your word of honor to cause no trouble? I will not. Listen. Just as soon as the eclipse starts, we're going to take you and put you in a closet with the door closed, and you'll stay there. Then you won't see the darkness, and you won't see the stars. And that means the loss of your immortal soul according to the cult. All right now, will you give your word of honor? You have it. You will all be damned for your deeds of today. Look! Cameras! Yes, sir. Check the exposures carefully. We will, sir. You're shaking, Mr. Theremin. Well, I, I don't feel very well, that's all. You're not losing your nerve? No, no, I'm just not used to this. You could probably make the hideout. Now look, I've been assigned to cover a story and intend to cover it. Professional honor? Yeah. And I'd give my right arm for a bottle right now. I need a drink. Hello, no, no, no. Well, what's that? The cultist. Hello, That's the doctrine of revelations. Well, I don't understand it. He's chanting some Hello. old cycle language. The doctrine of revelations was originally written in it. There are probably two million people in Saro City who are trying to join the cult. One gigantic revival. Well, Dr. Sharon, how do the cultists manage to keep the doctrine of revelations going from cycle to cycle? If everyone goes mad, who wrote this doctrine? There are some people who don't see the stars, the blind. They would have memories, and that, combined with the confused, incoherent babbling of the mad, form the basis for the doctrine of revelations. The cult will be riding high down there in the city, I hope they make the most of it. Dr. Sharon. Dr. Sharon. I've just heard from Hideout on private line. They're in trouble? They are safe. But the city is in shambles. You have no idea. Can it get worse? What are you shaking about, Doctor? <laughs> How do you feel? I don't understand. The cultists are rousing the people to storm the observatory, promising them salvation, promising them anything. How long till the total eclipse? An hour. I'm going to check those cameras. It's a gamble. It'll take time to get a mob out here. If the darkness comes first, we're all right. Look at Beta. Yeah. It's cut in half. It's getting darker. An interesting phenomenon. My collar's suddenly tight. Are you having any difficulty in breathing? No. Why? Difficulty in breathing is one of the first symptoms we've experimented. I'm cold. It seems to be getting colder. We'd better keep our minds on something else. Yeah. One of the astronomers has a theory about the stars. He thinks they may be suns that are too far away to see in, in the light. He developed a fantasy about a planet revolving around one sun. It's a mathematical possibility. Of course, there couldn't be any life. Part of the planet would always be dark and without light. Well, it's obvious. Without light, there can't be any life. It's time for the artificial light. We can't read the instruments. Artificial light? One of the researchers in the university worked it out. It's animal grease packed around a wick. Here, I light it with this spark. <gasps> Why, it's beautiful. <laughs> Yellow light. After four hours of red. <laughs> it's beautiful. Light. Light. The dome is quiet. The priest in his yellow robe sways slowly as his lips move in the ancient tongue. Over and over he whispers the invocation to the stars. The technicians hunch over the instruments and the sky gradually turns a horrible deep purple red. The air grows denser. 
dusk, like a palpable entity, enters the room. The dancing circle of yellow light about the torches etches itself into ever sharper distinction against the ever-gathering grayness beyond. Outside, Beta is a mere smoldering splendor, taking a last look at the world. The western horizon in the direction of the city is lost in darkness, and along the highway to the observatory surges a menacing, shadowy mass. The mob from the city, they're coming. How long till total eclipse? Fifteen minutes, but that mob will be here in five. We'll hold them off. Come on, Thurman, downstairs. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no light down there. We have to block the door. Come on. I can't. I can't breathe. I can't go down there. Take a torch. We'll take light with us. Come on. <laughs> Atom! Atom! I'm here. Did you bar the door? They won't get in. All right now, everybody. One minute till totality. One minute. Just before totality, I'm changing the plate. That will leave one of you for each camera. Now remember, if you feel yourself going, get away from the camera. It's dark. It's getting dark. Sharon! Sharon, where are you? I can't see you. I'm Sharon. right here. 30 seconds. Ah! Look out, the priest! I can't see him! And the wicked shall perish, and the souls of the true believers shall be transported in glory to the stars! You can see him against the torch. Don't let him get to the telescope! From the stars there reached down a heavenly flame, and where it touched, the cities of the world flamed to utter destruction! Grab him! Grab him! I'll take care of him! The world must be destroyed by the stars! I got him! I got him! <laughs> Five seconds to totality. Four, three, two, one. The sky is black, and through it shine the stars. 30,000 minute suns shine down in soul-searing splendor. It's more frightening in its awful indifference than the bitter wind that shivers across the horrible, cold, bleak world. The stars. The stars! The stars! The walls! The walls are coming in on me! They're coming in! Light! Light! Darkness! Light! Forever and ever and ever, and the walls are breaking in! We did not know! We did not know! We did not know! On the horizon in the direction of the city, a crimson glow begins growing. A thousand fires strengthen in brightness that is not the glow of the sun. A million fires, as a world mad in the darkness screams in terror for the light. The night has come again. have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future, the world of... Dimension X. With this program, Dimension X concludes the present series. We hope to return to the air in the near future. Watch your local newspaper and listen to your local station for the resumption of the series. Dimension X is presented transcribed each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of the magazine Astounding Science Fiction. Today, Dimension X has presented Nightfall, written for radio by Ernest Kinoy from the story by Isaac Asimov. Featured in the cast were Lyle Soudreau as the reporter, Cameron Prudhomme as the astronomer, and John McGovern as the psychologist. Your host, Norman Rose, Music by Bert Behrman. 
Dimension X is produced by William Welch and directed by Fred Way.